With, with regards to Massimo Cellino, how much of the mess that GFH were in was he aware of? And how much of the mess that, that they'd left Leeds United in was he aware I of? I mean, the, you know, Massimo took over a mess. There's no way to describe that. You know, not only with the issues, obviously I'd left, and I had been involved in the club for a while, so there was no one to kind of hand it over to him to, and no one to say, well, this is this, this is that, this is that. Sean had obviously left, you know, so all the people that had, could help him take it over and help him resolve the issues were not there. Part of the design of GFH, you know, or part of the result of what they had done, you know. And so, I mean, one of the ridiculous things in what they said is that they say, or they say what they accuse me of, they knew about in January. Be December. So hang on a minute. You've accused me of stealing three million pounds. And you, you say you knew about that in December and January. Yet you let me in charge of an organisation in Dubai that's regulated with pots of cash or some money and a football club running it for four months before you did anything. Really? Really? Are we expected to believe that? You know, so going back to the question about Massimo, you know, he inherited a mess. He inherited a problem and he inherited, you know, incompetent idiots that they had to, he had to deal with, with the biggest egos on the planet. You know, and egos are fine sometimes if you've got knowledge behind that and you can add something to the party, you know, but they couldn't even bring wine. Do you feel any responsibility yourself for, for the mess that was left at Leeds United? Yeah, I, I feel responsibility in the fact that, you know, I brought GFH, you know, at the end of the day, and, you know, I worked on it to bring them in now I did my best to make sure there was money and I did my best and I do think that I did a lot of good there you know a lot of people go on about the debts and things like that but you know when you look at the debts the debts were to the parent company they're not independent debts so it's borrowing money from the parent borrowing the money from dad or mum so when you actually take all these debts out when you take out which was essentially internal financing and it's the way that GFH worked instead of putting money into shares which a lot of people do GFH made loans to companies because they can either then sell that loan to someone else later on because they're a finance house. So they don't want equity. They want loans and things that they can sell on. So when you take out all the connected debt and you look at the actual running of the business set against the background of the fact that there was no money in the first place and that there was no consistent plan of are we keeping it and developing it? Sorry, are GFH keeping it and developing it? Or are they selling it? You know, and there's two different streams. And because, you know, you would knee-jerk reactions constantly as well. I mean, I'll never forget, I'm not talking about this because it relates to the debt. I'll never forget when I was at Sheffield and I was having all these calls. We weren't doing very well. And I was there with Paul Hunt. Um, and I, I, I remember this, this very well. This was during Sport Capitals had, had signed the share purchase agreement. I'm sitting with Andrew, I'm sitting with Paul. Um, and I'm getting calls from Hisham fire Brian. And I'm like, I'm sorry, what? This is the Sheffield Wednesday game, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, you know, and WhatsApp and text messages, fire and Brian, do as you're told. Literally like this. Obviously, with Hisham, it's very bad while of spelling. Was that, was that half time? It was before game? half time. Before half time. I mean, right. half time was a, a mess of us trying to sort it out. And, you know, I'm, Paul and I were just, I mean, you can see in a lot of the pictures where you see, like, Paul and I sitting next to each other, our faces. And this is what we were dealing with. You know, it wasn't me looking at Twitter, it was me looking at idiot messages from Hisham with his bad spelling and his incompetence. And he was say, telling me to fire Brian. And I was saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going down in history as a person that fired a football. And he's like, take him out of the changing room now. So I said, no. Um, you know, and I'll, I, you know, and then I'll never forget because he's in the text message. Okay, well, I'm, this is Hisham. I will call the BBC and I will tell them I have fired Brian. It was like, go ahead. So then what do we do? We call sensible Salah. You know, Salah, please help, right? And Salah, you can't do this. It's a bad thing for your investment. Sport Capital don't want it done. You can't do this. You need to talk to a sham. If he calls the BBC, it makes us look like idiots, idiots. Um, and I mean, quite rightly so as well. I mean, who does that? And it was this kind of knee jerk inconsistency every day that I had to deal with. That, you know, that, I mean, who does that? You, you, if you want to remove a manager, you need to have a succession plan in place or have a thought process. You know, two weeks ago, you're talking about extending his contract to five years. Two weeks later, because you have a bad day in a football match, which happens, you, all of a sudden, you want to get rid of him and you want to tell the BBC at half-time that's how you're going to do it? And you're thinking about selling the club? I, 
you know, and I remember then that we had to, we had to go to Brian because he knew what was happening. He had all these missed calls from Hisham. So he's sitting there, he's trying to solve the problem. And meanwhile, he's getting calls from Hisham, calls from Hisham, calls from Hisham. And I only went to Brian and I said, Brian, don't answer any of these calls. You know, don't do this. You've got to let it calm down. If you answer that call, it could be disastrous. I will say that I have spoken to you. I'm going to lie to Hisham. I'm going to say that I said this, this and this to you. This is what he wants me to say. I'm not going to say that because this is ridiculous. You've got our support. Please ignore them. We're trying to get the deal through with Sport Capital. We want you to stay. And Paul was with me when I said this. Um, you know, so the mess that they created in, in, in Brian's mind and before him, Neil, with this flip-flopping inconsistency was disastrous for any business, let alone football. And, you know, that Sheffield match, I'll never forget it because, you know, luckily my phone ran out of battery and I was so relieved. And, you know, even then when I turned it on, I was accused of all sorts of things. And, and then after that was the ridiculousness of the memo, which Hisham insisted was being sent to, to Brian, which was basically constructive dismissal. And of course, Hisham doesn't understand the word constructive dismissal. And we're all trying to explain it. Um, and, you know, so he's insisting that we send a memo saying, you've got the Leicester game, don't win it, you're fired, basically. Which I was not going to send. I, there is no way I'm going to send that. Not least, I mean, ignoring Sport Capital for the minute, just as the MD, there is no way that I was ever going to get that, let that memo be sent. First of all, it's wrong. You know, it's not going to assist Brian in what he needs to do. And, you know, apart from that, it's caused us liabilities on the club. It's a constructive dismissal case. And so I went to the lawyers and I said, OK, Gibson done. Do a memo which you think is appropriate. Because this is going to end up with the you know, League Managers Association. It's going to end up everywhere. I don't want to send it. The owner's insisting I send it. And this is where I say, you know, I accuse of Hisham of being a shadow director because he was deciding pretty much everything until the two-week you know, vacations when he'd get in a strop and he wouldn't talk to anyone. You know, he wouldn't talk to any of us. Um, and um, I remember this because the lawyers came back with a letter which was didn't want to send it but it was okay right it was you know pull your socks up basically went to Hisham and bearing in mind top UK lawyers employment lawyers had done this it'd been reviewed by me it'd been reviewed by Paul so the club had were, okay we don't want to send it but if you're insisting this form's all right Hisham changes it to how he wants well obviously his great English and his great spelling and his knowledge of law and football and insists that it's sent but he doesn't want to put his signature on it is that David put your name on it? I'm, I'm not putting my name on it. I'm not sending this. And I, as I understand, it went out with my name on it without, without a signature. You know, and it was that absolute farce that, and I could go on all day talking about this, of yeah. these things. These are just some of the things that were in, were in my mind of what happened. Yeah. But the, the comedy of more that there was was ridiculous. You know, and, and the wasted money, the wasted thing. I mean, just this, the lawyers for this, you know, the decisions to get rid of staff and get rid of them the bad ways, the investigators they employ to come in and spy on people and, you know, enter their offices and copy their hard drives and search their emails. And, you know, they even had private investigators pretending to be staff, talking to secretaries to find out the gossip. And these because were on the lead payroll. They were being paid for by, by uh, GFH, but I think then invoice to Leeds. Wow. But they were basically, so you know, you, you, you're in the accounts team, you turn around, you talk to the new members. Who were they investigating? Who, who? Everyone, they were so paranoid, this is Hisham. He was so paranoid, he didn't trust anyone. Because, and you know, that comes I think a lot from what he's like. He's a devious person, and I can say that because he lied to me. And he lied to me in the most severe form to get me to a country where he could do all these terrible things to me. He's a liar, he's a cheater, and he's a devious person. And because he's like that, he thinks everyone else is. So, you know, I mean, and again, I've worked in private equity in a lot of law firms, a lot of banks. I've never seen someone that purchases a company, which value-wise, monetary value-wise is relatively small, and puts in a spy into the staff, who literally is an ex-spy. Who does that? You know, to report on how much you're spending on a cup of tea and who talks about who. I mean, I read the report, it was comical, you know. And, you know, the, the guy basically talks to the secretaries for, for, for gossip. It was things like that. And, and, the, and, you know, and then just the nastiness about it all. And like I said, it's like the seven sins and, and yeah. It is amazing. Um, 
Massimo Cellino uh, comes around uh, and uh, around that time of Sport Capital. How many other offers were there for, for Leeds United at that point? It was serious offers. How many other people were interested? None. None at all? I mean, there was, you know, there was Sport Capital, which for whatever reason hadn't worked. Um, you know, and I can't talk too much about that because it is part of an ongoing case where Sport Capital is suing GFH for £33 million. Um, but Massimo, basically, that was it. And when you say serious, I mean somebody that, that had the money, could do it, and wasn't going to take a year or two. Massimo. GFH is still involved now uh, mm -hmm. with Leeds United. Uh, they've obviously got a reduced amount of uh, percentage in, in Leeds United than they had then. How important is it for Leeds United to get rid of GFH? I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, obviously, I can't speak for Leeds United anymore. So I can speak for me as a Leeds fan and, and as the XMD. You know, when look at look at what they've. Let's take an example of leaving Leeds aside. Look what they've done to me. They've broken international law. They've lied. They've been devious. They've involved themselves in torture, in human rights abuses, and you know. They've done the most horrific, despicable things that you can think of. Does any company in England want a shareholder and directors that have clearly been seen to have done all of those things? Any company? No. Does such a high profile company like Leeds want people involved with it like that? No. They're not suitable owners. You know, if you can get involved in making sure someone's tortured, if you can lie to someone to lure them to an Islamic country to lock them up falsely for two years and then have them beaten up through your, your lawyers, that, that's not even humanity, let alone being involved in a football club. So that's one element. Now, in terms of from the lead side, what can they contribute? Have they got money? No. Have they ever really put money in? No. Are they stopping Massimo from being able to purchase the stadium? Yeah. Because, you know, why would he purchase it if they get however many percentage they own? Because he comes under a lot of criticism, Massimo Cellino, because of the things he said at the beginning about buying four parks, buying the stadium, and that hasn't happened. I mean, I honestly don't know the full reasons for that, right? And I don't want to put words into anyone's mouth, but, you know, I know from, and I think this, this may be the reason, you know, and I know from my side that, you know, if he bought the stadium, he would purchase it, GFH would get 25%. Is that more or less likely to get them to leave? All of a sudden, you know, because of the value of the stadium, they'll get, they'll get a good investment on their books and a property investment. That makes them less likely to leave. So why would you do something which makes them stay when you really want to get rid of them? You know, you know now, from a financial perspective, it's a no-brainer to buy the stadium, ignoring the fact that we want, we want the home back. But it's a no-brainer. So I'm sure Massimo would want to do that. You know, anyone would. I mean, the irony for me was that GFH never did it. You know, during my time there, GFH purchased the property, and I know because I did all the, the legals for it. I mean, I was running a football club by day and getting down the train and showing shakes around a property in London by night. And, you know, they paid 12 million quid for it near enough. A little bit more you could have bought the stadium. That 12 million quid property, I think, probably they made a million pound profit on it, if that, maybe half a million. Yeah, you buy the stadium for 16, 17, whatever it is now, you just put it on your books, 50, 60. Smart investment bankers or not? Yeah, and talking uh, figures as well, and we sort of uh, talked about certain fees that they're sort of paid out to uh, different uh, 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 private detectives yeah. and solicitors. Um, how much was GFH taken out of Leeds United in fees? I mean, I don't know because there's all this nonsense about these dodgy invoices. Um, I mean, I remember, I mean, in terms of they were charging interest on the loans, right? So that was an amount, and they are still doing that today. They were billing pretty much everything to the company. So every travel, every this, everything. Everything was being billed to the company. They were even billing invoices, whether this is accident or deliberate, I don't know. I have my suspicions. Um, invoices from other projects to the company. Lawyer, lawyer fees, Gibson Dunn fees, I think was one of them. Um, uh, and, you know, so they were using it to pay pretty much everything, but they were re-invoicing. So that, that's what they were doing. And then there's all this nonsense about these false invoices. So, I mean, in terms of them billing their time, I mean, I mean, to be honest, as much as I'd like to say, yeah, they were billing millions, they weren't, 
right? That what they were doing was charging interest on the loans, which ultimately I think has come out to millions now, and putting pretty much every single professional expense ultimately back on these and adding it to their loan. So for instance, if they, they hired a lot of various consultants um, to, 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 to tell them you know, what they need to do, that would ultimately be put back onto the, the, the books of Leeds. So they would pay it and they'd issue an invoice to Leeds and Leeds didn't have the money, so that was added to a loan. So what, what this debt that you saw going up and up and up was basically money owed to GFH for things that GFH were paying, which as a shareholder, they probably should have paid themselves rather than you know, travel ticks, first class here, all this kind of stuff. And, and, and looking back now in sort of the cold light of day, how much responsibility do you feel, do you think the fans feel that you should have for what happened with GFH and what happened with Leeds United? You know, I'll tell you something that upsets me. Um, you, you know, I mean, obviously I'm uh, you know, a big boy and etc. But the, the fans, and this is, you know, in, something that I want to address later on and I uh, will be more than happy to sit with fan groups. And I always did this. I mean, even, I think, after uh, the, the, in the worst closing days of Wilds Road Leeds, you know, none of the other GFH directors would help. They had all vanished. You know, there was no money. There was this chicken race with the Football League. Nothing was being paid. I was paying expenses on my personal credit card, which I still haven't got back, I might add. Um, and, you know, I still went to um, a Lusk meeting, and I still went to a Lusk meeting as well. And, you know, and so for me, I'd, I'd be more than happy to sit with fans and talk to them like you and I are talking, right? I've got nothing to hide, right? And what upsets me is that, and it's business, you, you understand this, that the fans don't see what I did. The fans don't see how much time that I put into that. And you can see from my health, you, you know, how ill I've looked, you know, and, you know, how much that I tried to get that club a proper owner, to get rid of GFH, to save it, to keep things running, to keep people happy. Um, you know, I tried so very hard. And, but when you have a shareholder that doesn't have money, and that that shareholder doesn't know what they're doing, whether they're selling it or they're keeping it, or they're selling it or they're keeping it, and they don't know about football, and they're petulant, and they're inexperienced, and they're corrupt, and they've been pinching Iranian money to invest in the football club, and you're trying to juggle all of this, you know, as well as make sure that they don't upset the manager. You know, you'd, you'd have Plumin, you know, Salim would be talking to the players direct on Twitter, you know, private messages on Twitter. So I'm trying to, you know, at the end of the day, the players have an issue, they go to the management team. They should not feel that they've got an ability to go direct to a director because he's got an ego and he wants to be able to say, oh yeah, I can talk to these players. What's this? So I'm trying to manage all these Muppets and Muppets is the only way to describe them. Um, you know, I'm trying to manage all of this as well as do all of everything else and, you know, try and find a new good owner. And that means, because a lot of people talk about the PR spend, you know, to bring in people, we need at least to make sure that it's attractive. And if people could see the absolute muppets that were running it, and the mess, and the nonsense, and the stupidness, no one would be interested, you know? And, you know, at the time that Massimo came in, had he not been there, and obviously with the issues with Sport Capital, had Sport Capital not been there, would Leeds be here now? I actually don't think it would be. Really? Mm. Okay. Um, f from your own point of view, um, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the sense of responsibility of what happened, uh, there's certain fan uh, uh, groups that might think that you had your, your own plan mm. almost from day one, that, you know, you, you, and maybe it was a vanity product for yourself that you would want, you definitely wanted to be the CEO, you wanted to be the MD, and it wouldn't have mattered who owned it as long as you, you were involved. No, it wasn't, you know, and to be honest, I didn't want to be the MD, and I didn't want to be the CEO. What my ideal role there would be something like, you know, a vice chairman that goes out and does all the community projects. That's what I wanted to do. You know, I know that I didn't know how to run a football club. I know that, you know, I'm a lawyer and a financier. So what I wanted was to help with the financing, and I wanted to do the community projects, which is the thing that I really enjoyed. That's what I wanted to do at Leeds, you know, and that's why at the beginning I was a director. And that, that's what I wanted to develop. And I did a lot of the community projects. I, I think, you know, we reached out a lot. We invested a lot more in the foundation. And that's the thing that I enjoyed. And, you know, getting the players out to meet the, the community and getting the community back in the club. That's what I wanted to do. You know, day to day running a football club, I didn't want to do it. The reason that I was made, you know, everyone says, oh, David Haig negotiated a contract for himself. No, I didn't. 
GFH wanted me there in that contract at the time because remember when they were selling, they basically were, you know, leaving a lot of debt in there, right? And they wanted someone around that they felt would protect their interests. So, you know, when, when it was being sold to Sport Capital, you know, initially I was going to stay obviously doing my job, but we were going to appoint a new MD. It wasn't going to be me. You know, then I was going to move up and, and, and sit on the board with Andrew. It wasn't going to be me running it. And that was, in, that was something which was in my control if I wanted to be there. And that's all in the document. So, you know, the, the, that shows you that, no, I didn't want to be the CEO. I was put in as the CEO by GFH as a compromise because they didn't want Salim. You know, Salah didn't want Salim. When Sport Capital was taking it over, I was there initially, but the plan was to recruit a new one. And Andrew and I had talked about various people that we could put in place as the CEO already. You know, because I wanted to do other things. I wanted to develop sport capital. I wanted to do other things than run that. And I wanted to get someone in that was good and that we could trust and that we could assist them in the bits that we're good at. You know, so, you, you know, Andrew, and, and so that, that was the plan. And then when Massimo came in, the reason why I was in that contract was because GFH wanted me there. You know, they wanted someone that they felt would protect their interests. You know, the, the idea that I would want to sign myself up for two years, you know, in the mess that I had just experienced, in the, the, the state of health that I was in, with what I could see was going to be challenging at best, managing all of that, why would anyone do that, right? And I tell you, I think even, I don't even know if I was even gonna be paid or I can't remember now. So it was just put there. It was actually put there at the beginning without my kind of consent or knowledge or anything like that. You know, there were, I mean, there were discussions and, 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 and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so it wasn't David negotiating himself a role. You know, that you know, for me, even from a financial perspective, you know, it's better for me to go elsewhere. You know, and if uh, you had a, a message for, for Leeds fans after all this time now, if you had a message for Leeds United fans, what would that message be? In what sense? I mean, about uh, what's happened at Leeds United since uh, the takeover of GFH to, to this point now. If you had a message for, for Leeds United fans about that whole time, is it uh, an apology, or are you are you sorry for what what happened during that time? Are you? Uh, are you I think you know. I think with GFH, you know, I think what you what they what I would say to Leeds fans is that you, you know, and I'm more than happy to sit with any group that wants to talk to me you've got to look behind the headlines and the gossip and you've got to look at what really happened and make your judgments on that. Don't you make your judgments on what's on Twitter or what's in the headline or what someone says down the pub. Talk to the people involved, see the facts, see the statements. I mean, one of the things that I'm gonna do, it's a project that's underway at the moment actually, and obviously there's confidentiality issues in it, but the plan is to publish everything relating to my case and my time there on the internet to be 100% transparent so it's it's there you decide for yourself now I'm gonna have all sorts of legal issues with that I know but we'll overcome them somehow and that's one of the things that I want to do so it's basically look at the what really happened make your own judgments and you know at the end of the day this is all history it's important because it's history but the thing is about the club going forward you know we can all gossip about the past who did that who did that you, you know the reason why it's important to a certain extent is because GFH is still a part of it. So what I would say is that this is history, this is bad. The people that connect you to that history are GFH. You know, I'm not in Leeds anymore. I mean, Sport Capital have got a small amount still in there. I'm not doing anything with it, but um, GFH are. So focus on them. Do you want them as your shareholder? Do you want them on the board running your club? And do you think, having seen what they're capable of and what they've done, that they should be there? So focus on them and then focus on bringing the club forward. That's all it's about at the end of the day, getting that club back to where it belongs. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, nothing else matters. It's how do we do that best? How do we do that and make sure we stay there and you know, get the whole community behind the club? Because you, you know, it's an amazing club, it's an amazing city. You know, I miss it terribly, absolutely terribly. I miss going into that stadium every day and seeing the fans and talking to people and seeing the players, I miss it. I mean, it was horrific while I was there with the idiots that I was dealing with and the Muppets in Bahrain, but you miss that. And that's why it's such an amazing place and such an amazing club. And so you probably wanted a short thing for me to say, but you know, 
for me it's it's look to the future and 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 you know grow and and like what we said you know be united together everybody because when you're fighting you don't get anywhere yeah no that, that, that's very very true i mean I, I, just interestingly today massimo Cellino has come out in the times today mm. saying he's looking to sell the club but then we, we've heard that before for, from massimo Cellino, haven't we so it's it's still so up in the air now for these fans yeah i think you know, running and owning that, that club is challenging because you know particularly with gfh i've been there you know i mean <laughs> You know, uh, you know, I mean, Paul Massimo, I mean, imagine if, if they invite him for a meeting and he's having a contractual dispute for them. Would you go? No, I don't think I would. Does that sound like there's something else they're trying to cover up? I need to get to the, I need to get to the office. So the car is, and it's a nice car, it's theming and doing everything it can to make sure I don't get there. And then this guy's like, come with me. I'm like, what do you mean come with you? Come with me. I was like, why? 